So in our study of John's gospel, we've arrived at the place where Jesus is preparing His apostles for His death and resurrection. You know, this is a very long section, so we've had to break it up into several different uh, lessons. And He does this uh, in a couple of ways, getting His uh, apostles ready. You know, he knows what's going to happen. He knows that he's, you know, the, the, the terrible things that are going to take place. They don't know, they don't get it yet. So he's trying to get them ready. You know, getting someone ready for something they don't know is going to happen. It's a kind of a difficult thing. So a couple of things that he does. First of all, he washes their feet. And this is done to impress upon them the need for you know, humility and service after he's gone. You know, they were already fighting among themselves in his presence. Imagine, imagine how bad it can get. They're arguing among themselves while he's there. So he wants them to remember this action, this attitude when their pride gets out of hand in the future. Uh, you know, I call it a living parable. No words were spoken, just a living parable. That'll kind of really impress upon their minds um, their proper attitude towards one another. He also purges them of the traitor. G, uh, Judas was, you know, he was the weak link. And so Jesus reveals his treachery and forces him out before the actual event. I mean, had Judas stayed, he could have you know, led them to disbelief and total abandonment or turned them all into the Jewish leaders. You know, if, he tra if, he, if he was a traitor and if he was ready to hand Jesus over to the uh, you know, authorities, I mean, he could have done it with the, with the other apostles. You know, if, he's, if he's able to do it with Jesus, he's certainly able to do it with the other apostles. And so Jesus forces his hand. He's out of the group. He doesn't know where they are. And then the third thing, he prophesies concerning his death and resurrection. He keeps saying it over and over again. They're not grasping it, but he's reminding so that they won't be caught by surprise. He tells them in advance that he'll be killed and eventually he'll resurrect. Now, when the deed is done, he wants them to be assured that he is still in control. And the way to do that is to, you know, they'll remember, wait a minute, he predicted this. He told us this would happen because there's this period between the time he's dead and in, in the tomb, and they're wondering what's going to happen. And so uh, he, he's reminding them, pointing them towards the future. And then he promises to take care of them. You know, he promises to send the, the Holy Spirit to comfort them in their sorrow and provide the support that usually came from him. He was the one that encouraged them when they were discouraged. He was the one that answered their questions when they were confused. He was the one that pushed them along you know, in faith and so on and so forth. Now he's going to be gone. And so he's telling them, I'm, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be doing a lot of the things that, that Jesus did. He also promises to send the Spirit to help them remember and to understand all things that he taught them. You know, uh, I wonder if, if I gave you a test over what I taught here three weeks ago, how many could fill in all the blanks? I don't even know if I could fill in all the blanks. So imagine three years. Imagine all the time they spent with him. And, so, and they're responsible for carrying on his teachings and so on and so forth. So he, he assures them that the Spirit will help them not only remember everything, but understand everything that he's taught them in context. He also promises that Satan's attack on him will fail. You know, he tells them, don't, don't be afraid. There'll be a terrible moment, but don't be afraid. And then he promises that he and the Father will be with them as they love each other and they obey his word. And so these promises are all included in the first teaching and dialogue section that we, we talked about last week. This week we start chapter 15, as I said, and this will be the second part of Jesus' long teaching section that takes place just before His death while they're in the upper room. Okay, so a little review, a little you know, looking back at what we've talked about so far. 
Now in the previous section we learned that Jesus and the apostles, they're in the upper room, they're having share, they've, they've shared the Passover meal, and although John doesn't mention it, the Lord's Supper is instituted at that time as well. Now in this setting, Jesus has been teaching and encouraging them. Now before, His teaching was interrupted by questions from the apostles. Remember I said it was a series of dialogues. He'd teach something, one of the apostles would ask a question, he'd answer it and so on and so forth. That's what was going on uh, before. In, in today's section, he goes on for a long stretch without any comments from his disciples. And so in chapter 15, he touches on three subjects not directly related to the cross, but rather how they should act because of the cross. So in the last section, he tells them, I'm going to the cross and I'm encouraging you in a variety of ways. You know, despite this terrible thing happening, don't be afraid and so on and so forth. I'll send a comforter, you know, serve each other, love each other. Now he's going to explain to them how the cross will affect their lives and how they should react and act because of the cross, okay? So that's the context of chapter 15. So because of the cross, number one, he tells them they should bear fruit. They should bear fruit. Now Jesus has already taught them concerning obedience, that this you know, the idea of obedience along with love is the response of faith that He requires. He does this for us, what do we do? We respond in faith. How does faith look? What does it look like? Well, faith looks like obedience to what He, you know, if we obey what He says, we're demonstrating our faith in a concrete way. Now in chapter 15, He explains in detail the blessings and the curse attached to one's obedience or disobedience. All right, so we look at verse one and two. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, He prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. So these two first verses summarize the entire 11 verses that address this particular subject. That's how Many times Jesus teaches, you know, he, gives you a, he gives you the whole idea in summary form and then He breaks it down and explains it. And so what He's using is uh, allegory, the use of imagery you know, to make a point in concrete terms. For example, Jesus, well, He's real. The vine, that's the image. The Father in heaven, He's real. The vine dresser, that's an image. So Jesus uses a lot of these I am allegorical statements in order to make a concrete point. We've seen them in the past. For example, He says, I am the bread of life, John 6. Was He a loaf of bread? Was He actually you know, flour, water? No, that's an image. He said, I am the light of the world, January, uh, January, John chapter, <laughs> John chapter eight, right? So, what, is he a light bulb? Was he no, of course, it's an image. It's imagery. He says, I am the door, John 10. Again, imagery. I am the good shepherd. Was he a shepherd by trade? No, of course not. Uses imagery. I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light, John 14. So here the imagery is that of a vine and its fruit, a common sight in Israel. So Jesus says that He is the true vine, meaning the real vine, the original vine upon which all the others are patterned in design and, and function. He also says that the Father does the work of pruning that vine. Jesus bears the fruit, the Father harvests the good, and He removes the unproductive branches. And so the disciples, they're the branches that are connected to the vine. And the fruit is what the disciples produce because of their relationship to Jesus. A nice compact image that explains the working of our relationship to Christ and through Christ to God the Father. Now, in another place, the Apostle Paul tells us that fruit, you know, the fruit that Jesus is talking about here, produced in the disciples' lives through the Holy Spirit, 
that fruit includes you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? the fruit of the Spirit. Now, of course, the fruit is also you know, good works, that's fruit. Or uh, perhaps uh, uh, winning a soul, you know, sharing your faith and bringing someone to Christ, that's fruit. In the past, this passage has been narrowly interpreted to the harm of many. Because there were some that were interpreting the fruit that we bear strictly as soul winning, strictly as bringing someone to Christ. That was the only fruit that Jesus is talking about here. And so there was a tremendous pressure put on people to you know, go out and win souls and so on and so forth. And if you're not winning souls, you're not bearing fruit. Well, that's partly true. That's partly true. But it's overemphasizing. It's, it's, it's squeezing out of that passage more than what that passage is saying, or certainly not emphasizing. There's lots of different kinds of fruit that we, that we, uh, that we bear. Uh, you take your time uh, one evening and you go visit someone who's sick in the hospital. That's, you're bearing fruit. Somebody calls and says, hey, my car's not working, could you swing by and pick me up for church? That's bearing fruit. You know, I mean, there's a million examples. All right? So to kind of narrow that down to one specific thing is to you know, make this passage mean what, not, not what it's meant to mean. All right? So in, summar, in, the, in the summarizing statement, Jesus explains the following ideas. We're still in verse one and two. He says, first of all, he's the only vine that produces this kind of fruit. There are other vines, but only he is the true vine, that spiritual fruit. In other words, you do a good deed just because it's altruistic and it's a good thing to do and you get a tax receipt, that's not, that's not spiritual fruit. His point is, the fruit you bear because of your faith, ah, that's, that's the fruit that God is, is looking for. He also says you must be connected to Him in order to become the fruit-bearing branch of this kind. Remember, I, I know people who don't believe in God who are generous. You know what I'm saying? I know people who don't believe in Christ who have uh, uh, done tremendous acts of service to the community. We've heard of people who uh, don't believe in Christ who have given their lives for a cause. You know. To help, their uh, to help their nation by themselves. Are these good works? Uh, of course they are. But Jesus is saying, for a work to be a work of the Spirit, it's a work that is done in the name of Christ or because of faith in Christ. That's what gives each work its value. So he says, you, know, you, you need to be connected to me in order to become a fruit-bearing branch of this kind. What does he say in another place? You know, even if you give a cup of cold water in my name. So the smallest thing done in the name of or because your faith in Christ, the smallest thing done, it counts. It has value spiritually. He also says that God the Father is active in either pruning for growth or cutting away the dead wood. You know, you ever notice that, and I don't know much about gardening, you know, my, my gardening guru is in the audience today, Ron, but uh, I don't know much about gardening, but I've always noticed that when you're you know, trimming, and stuff, it's counterintuitive. You got this nice bush growing, you know what I'm saying, what do you have to do? You have to cut it down. You know? I'm tempted to just leave it alone and grow. You know? It's counterintuitive. But I have been told you need to prune things down so that they'll grow again and, and grow even more and be more fruitful. Yeah, it's counterintuitive. Well, it's counterintuitive when we uh, face obstacles and difficulties and challenges in our lives, you know, and we're saying, God, I'm doing everything you told me to do. You know, I'm, I'm bearing this fruit that you told me to bear. And I, you know, look at this guy over here. He, he never goes to church, you know, he, he shines his car on Sunday morning. I, I'm, in, I'm teaching a class. 
It's counterintuitive. And yet I'm the one that has the obstacles. I'm the one that you know, I'm scrambling to find a job or my wife is sick or whatever. It's counterintuitive. And yet for the faithful Christian, Jesus is saying, well, God is doing the pruning. He's the one that's shaping you. And whether it's pruning you know, with scissors or you know, whatever, a branch or spiritual pruning, there's, there's pain, there's something needs to be cut away sometimes. And Jesus is assuring us that the Father is the one doing this in our lives. And of course, cutting away the dead wood as well. You either produce fruit, Jesus says, in which case you are pruned in order to allow more growth, or you don't produce, then you're simply cut away altogether. And some people say, well, how does he cut you away altogether? Sometimes a challenge comes up uh, that uh, makes you decide, you know what, this isn't worth it anymore. I've seen that a lot. Somebody's just bouncing along you know, for years, you know, their faith, they're doing nothing to feed their faith, they're not productive, blah, 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 blah. And then something happens in their life and they go, that's it, I'm out of here. I mean, I've seen people, I've seen people quit not just the church, but abandon Christ because of something someone said to them that they didn't like. <laughs> you know, Jesus is telling His apostles, look, they're going to beat you, whip you, kill you, run, out, run you out of town, take your money, kill your family, you know? but if you stay faithful to the end, you'll be saved. So along comes this guy and says, yeah, well, you know, Sister Josephine, didn't say good morning to me on my birthday, and so I just quit altogether. You think that guy has a hope? You, know what I'm, you understand what I'm trying to get across here? So uh, expect the adversity. Enjoy the times of peace, but expect adversity, because it happens to all of us. All right, so you either produce fruit, or you don't produce and you're cut away and God is the one that does this. All right, let's keep reading here. I spent a lot of time on that. Um, you're already clean, Jesus says, because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified in this, or by this rather, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. So after his opening statement, the apostles First question might have been about their own situation, whether or not they were worthy of being branches attached to Jesus. You know, can't you just see it? Well, am I a branch, Lord? Am I okay? You know, it's always the thing that we ask, right? So the Lord reassures them that they are clean. In other words, they're worthy. They're purified. They have reached a certain state because they believe Jesus' words. Don't worry, He's saying to them, you are branches in me because you've believed. In other words, they're not branches because of their closeness to Jesus, you know, the proximity physically. They are branches because they believed Jesus' word and they have obeyed it. This is what has made them clean. So I want to go back over this, you know, if you have your Bibles, keep it open to that passage. Jesus emphasizes that if they wish to produce fruit, they must remain part of Him. And then Jesus goes on to mention seven specific details concerning the relationship between the vine, the vine dresser, and the branch. All right, so let's take a look at this, all right? First thing he says, you become a branch by believing and obeying the word of Christ. That's how you become a branch. You believe what? That He is the Son of God. What do you obey? 
His command to repent, to be baptized, to follow Him. You become a branch. Next, you remain a branch and you produce fruit by continuing to believe and obey the words of Christ. We're such a do generation. We, want, we have to do stuff, you know, bearing fruit, do this, do that, which is fine, you know, making an effort. But Jesus tells us continually believing in Him, that's fruit too. You're bearing, every day you wake up and, and, and pray, Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, help me to you know, do right or good or you know, guide me, whatever. That's bearing fruit, important fruit. Thirdly, the more you believe and obey, the more fruit you produce. It's not just the thing that you do. It's the fact that you have attempted to obey God that bears the fruit. The thing that's pleasing to God is you are attempting to obey Him. A lot of times, because many of us are perfectionists, A-types, we got to get it right, everything's got to be square, you know, it's got to be perfectly, you know, we're that type of person. Something we attempt to do, whether it's in obedience or or holiness, or, or an action, if it's not just absolutely perfect, we think you know, we get a zero. It, this is not a pass or fail thing. Jesus is telling, it, is telling us here, whatever we do in faith, the attempt that we do in faith, this is bearing fruit. It's never going to be perfect. If it was perfect, Jesus would not have to come. It's the whole point. Number four, he says, the less you believe and obey, the less you produce, the more you risk being cut away and destroyed. Of course. In Christianity, there's only two, two ways to go. You're going forward or you're going backwards. There's no standing still. Number five, he says, the more you believe and obey, the greater power your prayers have in being answered. Oh man, think about that. The more you believe and obey, the greater power your prayers have in being answered. I tell people sometimes, you say, man, I've been praying for this for years and years and years. And I say, well, persevere in prayer. But while you're persevering in prayer, examine yourself a little bit. You know, is there something there that needs to go? Or is there something there that needs to come? You know what I'm saying? Examine yourself in prayer. Sometimes God withholds simply to force us to look at ourselves. Number six, the bearing of much fruit glorifies God. Of course. Someone says, you know, what is my purpose in life? Your purpose in life is to glorify God, not to pay off your mortgage or get your kids to the best schools, although these things, you know, good stewardship of what we have. You know, that's part of, being, of living in the world and you know, using God's resources in a good way, but that's not what I'm about. What I'm about is glorifying God. That's what I'm about. And then finally, number seven, he says, the way to a joyful life is to bear much fruit through obedience to Christ's word and the love of others. Interesting idea. He says, this will mirror the relationship and joy that Jesus has with the Father. Think about this now. Bring these ideas together. How we gain, this is how we gain the experience of being part of the Godhead because we're uh, uh, in or attached to Christ. Do, do we understand what has happened to us as Christians? So we have the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, right? That's the Godhead. Within the Godhead there's a relationship okay, of love, of mutual honor. Okay? So what happens? One person in the Godhead takes on a human form, comes to earth, you know, demonstrates deity and so on and so forth, dies, resurrected, and through faith we become attached to that Godhead, the Christ. And then the Christ is once again reunited, if you wish, His ascension to the Godhead. So, Fast forward a little bit. What, what is actually going to happen at the end? When the, you know, at the end, I've told you before, you know, everything all happens at once. 
Christ returns, the dead in Christ are raised, the living in Christ are caught up to heaven with Christ, the, 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 the evil, the unbelievers, and so on and so forth, they're judged. Satan is in the pit forever. The heavens and the earth destroyed. The new heavens and the earth appear, right? All in the twinkling of an eye. All of that happens, boom. Okay, what happens after that? Well, what happens after that is that through our association with Christ, we become part of the Godhead. I mean, that's, I can't get my whole brain around that idea, but this is what we're going towards. And so Jesus is saying, your obedience, it's not a slavish type of thing, your obedience is the way you're assimilated into Christ's character. Okay? And as you're assimilated into Christ's character through obedience to His word, it's not like you're a slave, psh, obey, psh, obey, no. How, how, how do you become part of Him? Well, it's through obedience to His word. And in addition to that, your love for the brethren, those two experiences coming together mirror the experiences that the God has, the Godhead has within itself. Get what I'm saying? In other words, we're getting like a little taste of what it's like to be part of that Godhead which is the ultimate fulfillment of reality for eternity. And so he says, you know, I want you to have a little taste of what's to come in the future after all of this is gone. And the way you do that is by assimilating yourself into me through obedience and by loving your brethren, these two actions together will cause you to understand and to experience to a certain degree what's to come in the future. And once you begin to experience that, he doesn't say it here, but it, you know, he, the, 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 you know, the intimation of that, once you experience that thing, there's no going back. <laughs> there's no, I mean, the, Satan couldn't give you enough to get you to go back once you get a taste of that. You know, it's like the iPhone, right? We got the iPhone. Anybody who gets an iPhone never wants to go back to a rotary phone at home. Right? Once you've got the iPhone, you can get online, you can do this, you can call, you can use it as an alarm, as a flashlight. You know, there's so many uses of that little piece of machine. Once you get one of those, boy, they're going to have to pry it out of your cold, dead hands, right? Because you'll never let it go. Well, it's the same thing. Once you experience this, there's no going back. It just builds on itself. All right, so let's keep going with our lesson. So because of the cross, they should bear fruit. Because of the cross, they should love each other. Verses 12 and 17, let's read. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. So Jesus continues in the style that he has used uh, previously, he summarizes the idea and then he explains it in detail. So he has given them the instruction to love each other several times and in different ways. You know, the foot washing, that was a, you know, a way of explaining to them um, how to love one another. Now this time, uh, the difference this time is that he establishes the ultimate level of love as the laying down of one's life for a friend. Now they may not be called upon to do this, but the willingness to do so will mark their love as a kind that he had for them. So you know, everybody, you know, everybody dies, uh, you know, not everybody, but people will die instinctively you know, to protect family. What was it, that avalanche? Did you hear about that avalanche, that rock avalanche there? And, and only one young lady survived, a teenage girl, and, and her father saved her. He kind of jumped, you know, he pushed her out of the way, and, he was killed. You know, that's instinctive to protect your, to protect your child, right? Uh, but to die just for a friend, wow, that's, that's, that's a willful act. 
It's a straight exchange for one life for another life. So although he mentions death, his death was not only for his friends, it was also for his enemies, which makes his love divine. You know, people will die for family, for friends, yes, maybe for an ideal, but to actually offer your life for your enemy, mm, not too many people ready to do that. So Jesus focuses on the word friends and He brings up the idea that they have become His friends. Imagine, a friend of God. Hmm. I'm sure a lot of us would like to be a friend of the coach of the thunder, for example, right? Get some tickets, whatever. Be the friend of a, a high-ranking politician or be the friend of a, a famous movie star. You know, wow, you know? Brad Pitt's my buddy, really, you know. I hear Jesus, the Son of God, is saying, you're my friends. In reality, they are His creation, His slaves, at very best His disciples, but Jesus raises them and us to the level of friends, why? Based on faith and obedience. They are friends because they are now privy to the secret, the mystery concerning the purpose of His coming, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, and also how things work. He's explained to them, you know, this is how you bear fruit, this is how you, you, you honor God. As opposed to what the priests and the Pharisees were saying. The priests and the Pharisees were saying, you know, you gotta, you gotta tithe mint and cumin and you've gotta be at the, you, know, you gotta obey all these laws that the rabbis had, had, had put forth and so on and so forth. He explains to them the real way to please God. So their friendship has some conditions. You know, we're thinking, is it really a friendship if there are conditions? Every friendship has conditions. No matter how laid back your friendship, maybe the condition of your friendship is that you keep in touch once in a while. That's the condition. Or maybe you know, that you're honest and fair. You, you just tell each other, you, know, you tell it like it is to each other. Or you don't mention touchy subjects. You, know, you got big ears. Everybody calls you elephant boy when you were a kid, you know what I'm saying? But your friend never talks about your ears, you know what I'm saying? You have this deal here. So a friendship with Jesus also has special conditions, but it's still a friendship because it yields all the things and more that a friendship produces. You know, our friendship with Him produces companionship, encouragement, support, joy, communication, edification, all this we receive in a relationship with Jesus. So Jesus qualifies the friendship and He defines the conditions. And this is so because, well, He's God and we're not. So He's going to define the conditions of the friendship, right? You know, when my daughter was in the military, she was friends with a girl who was a sergeant. She was a, she was a corporal. Um, the higher ranking soldier places the limits and defines the friendship, and she did, because of her higher rank and the orders that, of course, she was under. But they still had a, a friendship of sorts. They simply respected the boundaries that the military had put on that friendship, but they were friends. And even after both got out of the military, then they, you know, they would write each other, visit if they were in town, so on and so forth. So we can have friendships that are based, that have some sort of you know, rules and so on and so forth. So Jesus defines the friendship as one where He, as God, chooses us as friends and places the conditions on our friendship, that we produce fruit, that uh, He will answer our prayers. You know, what, what, what we're willing to do is produce fruit. What He's willing to do is answer our prayers. And what He's asked us to do to remain friends with Him is to love others. So His conditions for friendship are all those things that will contribute to the friendship continued spiritual growth, continued dialogue and prayer, continued love in His body. All right, so finally for this section, Jesus teaches, remember, He teaches because of the cross, I want you to bear much fruit, I want you to love one another because you're my friends, and finally, they should persevere in ministry. Now remember, He's preparing them for His departure, not only for the three days after the cross, but eventual departure when He will return uh, to the state of deity, if you wish, in the spiritual world. And that'll take place in 43 days. So he's got to prepare them for what they will face after the departure takes place. So let's read verse 18. He says, 
If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So again, Jesus summarizes the entire thought at the beginning of the passage. Essentially, he warns them of five things. Number one, the world is going to hate them. Just in case they thought that by bringing the good news of life and eternal, uh, eternal life, peace, joy, love to the world, just in case they thought, wow, the world's really going to be happy to hear that message. <laughs> he says, on the contrary, they're going to hate you for it. Be ready for that. Number two, the world will reject them. Be prepared for hatred and rejection because this is how they treated me. Number three, the world will not recognize them. The hatred, the rejection of this world will be due to the fact that they sense that you do not belong here. And you don't. You know, we're pilgrims in this world. We always sing that song. We're just passing through. When people get a sense that this is not your home, that you're just passing through, unless they agree or they believe the same thing, they resent you. It's like you're, you know, hey, you know, if you're not here, just move along. You're kind of trespassing. They get that sense. Number four, he says the world will persecute you. What the world rejects, the world wants to destroy because it is threatening. Number five, the world will not obey God's word. If they didn't obey with the Lord present in all His glory, they won't when the same word is preached by mere men. Now this is not the, uh, you know, the case in every instant, but it'll be the general rule as the apostles will begin preaching when he's gone, and he wants them to be ready for it. All right, verse 21, I need to move. It says, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. So now there's a reason why the world will hate, reject, persecute and disobey them, and it will have nothing to do with them. So you know, he's, you know, in the modern language, he's saying to them, just remember, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about me, he says. This is how the world will react to the truth of the gospel because they have not accepted the Father in the past. The Gentiles are into complete paganism and idolatry. And the Jews have hardened their hearts by refusing to accept the one sent by the Father. So in either case, the offense begins with an offense against the Father, 22 to 25. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my Father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my Father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. And so Jesus goes on to say that this rejection of the Father has no excuse. It's without excuse for the Gentiles because as Paul says, they have a witness of the Father through creation, through their conscience, and through the Jewish nation. It's without excuse for the Jews because Jesus was among them teaching and performing miracles for three years. They have no excuse. And it's without excuse because the word provided warnings about this happening. So to hate Jesus is to hate the Father. And Jesus tells them that the opposition to them because of this, even though it might be quite strong, has no basis, no excuse. All right, we're going to finish up. Verse 26 and seven. He says, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He'll testify about me, and, and you will testify also, because you have been with me from the beginning. And so this warning may shake them, it may frighten them, but Jesus promises again that He's going to send the Holy Spirit to be with them. And so the Spirit is going to help them in their ministry, in other words, bear witness, so that they can face all of the opposition 
without stumbling. Remember, he's saying you guys are going to have a rough time. You guys are going to have a rough time. How many times have you said to yourself in a spiritual battle that you're having, I can't do this on my own? Or have you ever said in your life, you know, you're, it, things are getting so rough and you're saying, I can't do this anymore. You know, it's somehow you get to the point you know when you've reached your limit. So Jesus is saying to them, you, know, you guys, you're going to be tested you know, to the limit. But don't be afraid that you won't be able to do it. I'll send you the Spirit. The Spirit will help them in their ministry so that they can face all of this opposition without stumbling. So there, things are going to be difficult and fearful moments when Jesus died, but there'll be equally discouraging times when they will have to go out and preach the gospel. So He prepares them for these times by encouraging them to, first of all, continue bearing fruit, continue loving each other, continue serving in ministry. You know, a lot of times when we encounter rejection and discouragement in our faith, we tend to retreat and lay low. Instead of doing what Jesus says, we should continue, uh, you know, we should, in other words, you know, uh, when things go badly spiritually, we tend to kind of want to go back and hide in a corner. And Jesus is saying, do the opposite. When things are difficult spiritually, lean in. Don't lean back, lean in, he says. Bear fruit, become a prayer warrior. Um, be productive, be loving and kind, find something to do. The, the thing I tell individuals who are suffering from some depression, obviously if you have clinical depression you need more help than this, but you know, sometimes you're down, you're discouraged and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, the best advice is, hey, get your eyes off yourself, open up your eyes and see what's out there um, and begin to serve and that usually uh, at least sets in motion those things that helps you get out of that spiritual funk. All right, I think we've covered that chapter. Appreciate your attention. That's it for lesson number 24.